This place has a way of making us think about the kind of future our young people will have. Everything we do here, we weigh on tomorrow's scales. Stone will break. There are 2,000 slaves on the ropes. There is the obelisk of your jubilee. Baka, put a thousand slaves to removing the sand until the stone settles to its base. You raided the temple granaries? Yes. You gave the grain to the slaves? Yes. Give them one day and seven to rest. Yes. Did you do all this to gain their favor? A city is built of brick, Pharaoh. The strong make many, the starving make few. The dead make none. She stinks a bit, but we could wash her. What would you think of it? Cleaned up a little. She's a child. What would it be like when it's a woman? How old would you say it was? 16, 17? I can speak, my lord. How old are you? Eh? Of course he can speak. How old's your daughter, dog? Odd the number of dumb people I meet when I set foot out of my palace. I rule over a kingdom of mutes. They're afraid. Quite right, too. Don't stand there. Put the wood on the fire. Hello, pretty. <laughs> Look at it. The odd thing is, it's so ugly that it makes such pretty daughters. You're a member of the family. Explain that. Well, at 20, before he lost his teeth and took on that ageless look the common people have, he may have been handsome, he may have had one night of love, one moment when he was a king and shed his fear. Afterwards, his pauper's life went on eternally the same. The moment faded, and he forgot it all. The seed was sown. Will she grow ugly too? Surely. If we made her a whore and kept her at the palace, we'd... Would she stay pretty? Perhaps. Then we'd be doing her a service, wouldn't we? No doubt. Ooh. Look at it. It understands every word. Stop staring at me, dog! Get me something to drink! Please, Bishop, no long words. All that's at stake here is its money. I need money to fight the French. Will the church give it to me? Yes or no? My lord, your illustrious ancestor, William the Conqueror, granted these tax exemptions to the church.
How good of you to come. So which of the painted peacocks is our Mr. Bingley? Well, he's on the right, and on the left is his sister. And the person with the quizzical brow? That is his good friend, Mr. Darcy. <gasps> That's miserable, poor soul. Miserable he may be, but poor he most certainly is not. Tell me. 10,000 a year, and he earns half of Derbyshire. 10,000 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in modern day terms, he's worth millions. And how did he get all of that? Put simply, like most of Jane Austen's characters, he inherited it. He was born to the right family at the right time. It's a little bit oversimplifying things just to say he inherited it. Is that Mr. Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire? I believe so. I must make myself known to him immediately. But He's sir, the nephew of my esteemed patroness, Lady Catherine. Mr. Collins, he will consider it an impertinence. Mr. Darcy? Mr. Darcy? <coughs> Mr. Darcy? Good evening. What interesting um, relatives you have, Miss Elizabeth. He owns a lot of land, and so what does he do with it? He rents it out to farmers, who will pay him a lot of rent in order to live on his land and work it. So Mr. Darcy is in essence a landlord who makes a ton off of rent, which is sort of a big job to be a landlord, but that's why, if you're Mr. Darcy, you hire someone else to do that so you can go hang out with Mr. Bingley and hit up the party season. R is greater than G. R is return on capital, historically 4 to 5 percent a year. And G is for economic growth. For most of human history, less than 0.1 percent a year, almost zero, because population grew slowly and agricultural productivity more slowly still. So if R is growing at 4 to 5 percent a year in economies that are barely growing at all, it's pretty obvious that those who have the capital, the rich, will keep getting richer and inequality will grow. What a beautiful pianoforte. My brother gave it to me. He shouldn't have. Yes, I should. Oh, very well then. <laughs> Easily persuaded, is she not? Handsome face. Lizzie, is it a true likeness? We are the rich, one party goer remarked. We own America. We got it, God knows how, but we intend to keep it if we can. Just a minute, son. Just 30 short days. I'll dig up that 5,000 somehow. Shut me up, shut me up. Pa. Just Have you minute. put any real pressure on these people of yours to pay those mortgages? Times are bad, Mr. Potter. A lot of these people are out of work. Well, foreclosed. I can't no. do that. These families have children. Pa. They're not my children. But they're somebody's children, Mr. Potter. Are you running a business or a charity war? Well, all right. Not I'm... with my money, Mr. Now, you take this loan here to Ernie Bishop, you know, that fellow that sits around all day on his brains in his taxi, you know. I happen to know the bank turned down this loan, but he comes here and we're building him a house worth $5,000. Why? Well, I handled that, Mr. Potter. 
You have all the papers there, his salary, insurance. I can personally vouch for his character. Friend of yours? Yes, sir. Uh, you see, if you shoot pool with some employee here, you can come and borrow money. <laughs> what does that get us? A discontented, lazy rabble instead of a thrifty working class. Now, you're right when you say my father was no businessman. I know that. Why he ever started this cheap penny ante building alone, I'll never know. But neither you nor anybody else can say anything against his character because his whole life was... Why, in the 25 years since he and Uncle Billy started this thing, he never once thought of himself. Isn't that right, Uncle Billy? He didn't save enough money to send Harry to school, let alone me. But he did help a few people get out of your slums, Mr. Potter. And what's wrong with that? Well, here, you're all businessmen here. Don't it make them better citizens? Doesn't it make them better customers? You, you said that they, what did you say just a minute ago? They, they had to wait and save their money before they even thought of a decent home? Wait, wait for what? Until their children grow up and leave them? Until they're so old and broke them down that they, they, you know how long it takes a working man to save $5,000? Just remember this, Mr. Potter, that this rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community. I look back at myself now and am surprised at how little awareness there seemed to be in Washington of what was going on around the country. Opinion in the newspapers was pretty much Republican. And it was in the interest of the Republican owners of the newspapers to play down bad news about the state of the economy and play up good news because bad news would suggest that there was something wrong with the Hoover administration. President Hoover remained opposed to increased demands upon the federal government. What our people need is the restoration of their normal jobs, the recovery of agricultural prices, and the business. It's more than a political campaign. It is a call to arms. Give me your help not to win votes alone but to win in this crusade to restore America to its own people. You and I know that immediate relief of the unemployed is the immediate need of the hour. <laughs> the present leadership in Washington stands convicted, not because it did not have the means to plan, but fundamentally because it did not have the will to do. Just remember this, Mr. Potter, that this rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community. Well, is it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? Anyway, my father didn't think so. People were human beings to him, but... In the 1930s, the country is still sunk in the Great Depression. So while America was still the world's largest economy, huge segments of it were more or less lying fallow, we might say. The United States, United Kingdom, and France had not come back after World War I in anything like the robust way that the authoritarian regimes did by militarizing their economies. Nazis were spending millions. We had a lot of idle capacity in our factories, in our capital, in our labor supply that need to be called into action. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was not the candidate of big business. But he calls Big Bill Newsom from General Motors, who was a genius for the vast production that Ford was able to achieve, the assembly line and all those kinds of things. Newsom stood up and said, yes, sir, what can I do? FDR said, need your help. How do we do this? And will you lead it? He had such rapport with the titans of industry that he could call people, convincing them that there was a broader national cause to put people back to work and to put the productive capacity at its highest level.
In America, the only way we were going to do that is let business be business and let producers produce. It's another example of what the sheer strength and capacity of a free market economy put to a purpose can accomplish. The However, in 1941, the Japanese military attacked the U.S. naval base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, dragging the U.S. into the Second World War. The country mobilized millions of soldiers to fight in both Europe and the Pacific. Furthermore, the war created tremendous demand for tanks, airplanes, and other equipment to support the war effort. The production of these instruments was a massive stimulus to economic production, creating millions of jobs for the U.S. economy. A very optimistic view of how the market works, which sometimes is associated to, to Adam Smith, is the view uh, that you have self-regulation of the market and that the, the natural forces, natural market forces can take care of everything and in particular can ensure that inequality will never uh, increase uh, to such an extent that it becomes uh, socially and economically and politically uh, useless or even uh, dangerous for that matter. You see that you, know, you cannot expect everything from the market. You cannot just rely on natural forces to solve uh, all problems. And I think With peace, hundreds of thousands throughout the country left war plants for the last time. And now we face the problem of reconverting factories. At United States employment offices throughout the country, former war workers line up to register for new jobs. And shortly, washing machines and other luxuries we've missed will be pouring from the factories at 1942 prices. And soon you'll be able to give that jalopy a well-earned rest. With gas again plentiful, and with new cars and new tires on the way, America will be rolling with a pre-war flourish. War production stockpiles were so great that even before VJ Day, the industry could turn to a limited civilian production again. It moved fast to create jobs and products needed by post-war America. The demand for new cars was so pressing, there was no time for gaudy trimmings and super streamlining. We just wanted good, substantial automobiles. Our products must be as strong and durable as our way of life. Post-war strength must be consistent with our wartime show of power. Indeed, those of us who have personal needs must be ready to give all American industry time to catch up with these new days of peace. The National Citizens for Eisenhower Nixon have presented this message to all thinking voters, regardless of party affiliation. He's a big man who's used to handling big problems. Or maybe he's thinking about the folks who work every day in factories and offices or drive taxis. <laughs> of course, mine isn't one of the big jobs in the world, but it's important to me. And I get a feeling it's important to him. I think he knows all about people like me who work for a living. After all, he was born in a small town. His family was no rich in mine. He never had any money given to him. And everything he's got, he had to work for. You're thinking about the cost of living. 
You want to see living expenses stay at a reasonable level. You want your family budget to be protected against inflation. You're thinking about your children's future. You want them to grow up under the best possible conditions in terms of schools, health, and general welfare. And because they believe he represents their best hope of achieving these things, the women of America are making their choice for president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Jim's one of those bright young fellows you see around town. College graduate, advertising business, lovely wife, two fine kids, makes about 15,000 a year. Jim and Muriel Blandings are just like thousands of other New Yorkers. Modern cliff dwellers. The morning it all started was just another of those crisp September mornings. And the Blandings were still asleep. If you don't mind, dear. One moment. <laughs> Take your time. I can spare the blood. Did you cut yourself? I cut myself every morning. I kind of look forward to it. Yes, Mr. Sims, of course, if, if we were going to build a house, we'd want it... Uh, well, you know, just a little bit different. Oh, yes, yes. Of course, this is just a point of departure. You don't have to adhere to any of this. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't think we're at all ready to commit ourselves. Oh, right? no. Oh, but, uh, of course not. I understand well, perfectly. Well, uh, if this were my house, I'd... Uh, well, I mean... Uh... Now, in the study, if we could just push out this wall a little and put in a built-in bar... Excuse could... me, dear. Huh? These bedrooms are too small, and we'll have to have a little dressing room. Yeah, yeah, and closets, Mr. Sims. Plenty of closets. If there's one thing this family needs, it's closets. Yes, if I might make a suggestion. And bathrooms, you... Mr. Sims. Uh, each bedroom must have at least one bathroom. Yeah, but that would be four bathrooms, Mrs. Blandings. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Sims, now don't you forget. We've got to hold it down under 10,000. That, I can tell you right now, is impossible. Even with considerable trimming of the things that you've indicated, I don't see how we can bring it in for less than twelve or twelve thousand five hundred. Twelve thousand five hundred? Oh, well, I guess we're not going to quibble about a few pennies one way or the other. Of course, people cannot contribute to the nation if they are never taught to read or write. If their bodies are stunted from hunger, if their sickness goes untended, if their life is spent in hopeless poverty, just drawing a welfare check. So we want to open the gates to opportunity. But we're also going to give all our people, black and white, the help that they need to walk through those gates. My first job after college was as a teacher in Cotula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them. But they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home late in the afternoon after the classes were finished, wishing there was more that I could do. He made Medicare, hospital coverage for the elderly, a top priority. I'll spend the goddamn money. I may cut back some tanks, but not on health.
One of Medicare's uh, toughest bill, opponents will, was conservative Southern will, Democrat will, Wilbur Mills, who uh, fretted about the cost and idea of socializing medicine. It was Mills who led the powerful committee that controlled the fate of any Medicare bill, and Mills who would blocked Kennedy's Medicare efforts. He didn't hesitate to raise the issue of cost with President Johnson. The only thing I'm concerned about, and I'm very frank about it, is that there's about $450 million in this bill out of the general funds of the Treasury for which you haven't budgeted to your, uh, your uh, situation. Uh, yeah, but I, I'll take care of that. I'll do that. John Newly elected Senator Ted Kennedy, Johnson told Kennedy it was important to control the message on cost, lest Senator Russell find out. My health program yesterday runs 300 million, but the fools had to go to projecting it down the road five or six years. And when you project the first year, it runs 900 million. But the first thing Dick Russell comes running in and say, my God, you've got a billion dollar program for next year on health, therefore I'm against any of it now. Do you follow me? Right, right. Now, we don't want to stir up any more hornets, and we have to. No government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. So government programs, once launched, never disappear. Actually, a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. time we recognize that only people pay taxes. There's no way to pass them on to some impersonal organization. Eventually, every dollar government spends must come from the pockets of each one of us. And we must have a clearer understanding and a greater voice in what we buy. It's just possible that we can't afford everything that's presented to us as another free government service. Uh, there, is, there is this great wealth that I talked about, and that there's yet this great poverty. There are speeches made about the fact that we're going to treat everybody equally, and yet we don't treat everybody equally. There's talks given uh, and pronouncements made and laws written that uh, everybody's going to have an opportunity to have a job and have decent housing, and yet 43% of the people that live in the city of New York and live in this city are uh, live in dilapidated and run-down housing. And I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent as requested. The request came as yet more members of the 1st Infantry Division were arriving on the beaches of the new naval base at Cameron Bay. With every arrival, the commitment grew, and the road back was made all the harder. He made Medicare, hospital coverage for the elderly, a top priority. I'll spend the goddamn money. I may cut back some tanks, but not on health. Over the next decade, the cost of living more than doubled. The dollar lost more than half its value.
the results were disastrous. Vietnam and then Johnson's Great Society programs on top of that was too much demand for the economy, created this immense inflation. And Arthur Burns, chairman of the Fed, he did not do what a good central banker should do and raise rates to break the inflation. And by the time the 70s ended, it was a total mess. Prices went up infamously during the Carter presidency. Inflation was increasing and unemployment was increasing at the same time. Here comes the boss, the boss of the nation's largest airline. You can tell by the way he's treated, he's someone special. We print his ticket in 10 seconds because the boss doesn't like to wait. His bag is tracked by special computer. You don't lose the boss's bag. He likes room, so the nation's largest airline gives him more wide bodies. And on 727's more carry-on space, more than any other airline. The boss gets his choice of meals, a full meal or a diet meal. The boss is entertained with movies, stereo, and now his favorite television shows. The airline is united. The boss is you, the business traveler. You're a big part of our business, so he treats you like the important person you are. Where you're the boss. This is a beautiful place to relax. And this is a beautiful coffee to relax with. It is the new European style coffee from Hills Brothers. I think people who call their Winston tires Sam's are silly. Come, Herbie. I'm just a girl named Jane with a car named Porsche and a tire named Sam. Sure, I got Sam's under my cans. I'm Sam Winston. Lots of people call my Winston tires the best tire buy in town. If you're looking for the roots of America's contemporary economic inequality, the 1970s are a good milestone. Milton Friedman believed poor monetary policy was to blame and considered that central banks weren't aggressive enough in their efforts to fight inflation. great historical inversion. In the year 1967, for the first time in American history, the average American worker spent more time in what is called leisure time, in other words, more time at home when he wasn't or she wasn't sleeping than at work. That was the peak, 1967. Master Charge wants to give you all the clout you're working for. So when you shop, you can say, I'm in charge. That's real clout. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. I'm not president of the company yet, but I'm still in charge. Just what is wrong about big government? Why is it so dangerous? Well, when government gets too big, freedom is lost. Government is supposed to be the servant. But when a government can confiscate the earnings of the people with no restraint or no limit whatsoever on the amount that government takes, then government has become the master. And what would you propose to, to, turn, the, to turn the economy back towards fuller employment? Well, we would start an immediate program of cutting the income tax rates across the board for everyone to provide incentive for individuals. I reject the advice of those who think the only way to cure inflation is to throw millions of people out of work. This has been done in the past by administrations before mine, but I guarantee you that I will not fight inflation with your job.
Throughout history, every government eventually creates more of its currency. That could be to help fund wars, pay off debt, or protect against viruses. As governments print more money, trust between citizens and their currency starts to erode. People look for other ways to store their wealth, specifically within assets that would hold or appreciate in value over time. When companies or governments need to raise money, they have two options. Governments can issue bonds, and companies can, on top of that, also issue shares to investors. But what we're interested in are bonds. They're a form of debt that can last over different periods of time, from a few weeks to several decades. And unless something goes seriously wrong, you will get the full amount that you have invested. So this is how it works. The issuers of the bonds will make regular interest payments to those that hold them over their lifespan. When you buy a government bond, you're lending money to the government, which will use the sums raised to fund projects or infrastructure. In return, the government will make fixed interest rate payments at intervals specified by the bond coupon. These payments continue until the bond's maturity date, when the bond expires and you get your original investment back. Maturity dates range from a single year to 30 years or more. So if you invest £1,000 in a 10-year government bond with a 5% annual coupon, you'll be paid £50 every year for 10 years. And when the bond expires after 10 years, you'll get your original £1,000 back. Just like shares, bonds can be held as investments or sold to other traders on the open market. Think of a teeter-totter. Sitting on one side of the teeter-totter is interest rates. On the other side is the value of bonds. As interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. As interest rates go down, the value of bonds go up. Prices of existing bonds go down when interest rates rise. The opposite is also true. When interest rates fall, bond prices go up. Let's look at an actual 10-year treasury bond. This bond has a 2.25% coupon and matures in 10 years. The teeter-totter is flat when the yield to maturity investors demand is the same as its coupon, 2.25%. We can see the bond is priced at par, $100. But what happens to the price of this bond if investors now demand a yield to maturity 1% higher? When its yield increases 1% to 3.25%, the price now drops to $92. Inversely, we see that when the yield to maturity investors demand decreases 1% to 1.25%, the price increases above par to $108. Fixed income investments run the risk of not keeping up with inflation. Inflation is when the prices for goods and services rise. If this happens, investments with a fixed rate of return will have lower purchasing power upon maturity. When interest rates rise, bond price will fall below par. If interest rates have fallen instead, bond price will rise above par. Assume investors have bought bond A. When interest rates rise, bond investors may want to allocate their money into bond B that offers higher coupon rate. Carter acted decisively. To reduce the budget deficit and bring inflation under control, he cut into social programs. New realities, explained the White House, must temper our nation's commitment to the poor. It stirred up a hornet's nest of opposition from the Ted Kennedy people, from the traditional FDR coalition. They were very, very angry. African-American leaders felt betrayed and vowed to wage an all-out fight on what they called Carter's immoral, unjust, and inequitable budget cuts. Reducing the deficit will require difficult and unpleasant decisions. We must face a time of national austerity. Hard choices are necessary if we want to avoid consequences that are even worse.
Jimmy Carter did do something about the inflation rate. He more than doubled it. The war in Indochina brought us inflation as high as 6% a year. That's where our troubles started. In that war, which the government tried to pay for without raising taxes nearly enough. And that's another reason war makes inflation. It costs so much we never pay for it all at the time. So why even bother to ask, is inflation bad? Because the answer is it isn't always if taken in moderation. Since World War II, our dollar has lost more than half its value, but that took over a quarter century. And in that time, most of us came to live far better than we did when the dollar was worth more. In fact, one of the reasons we have inflation is that we decided to never have another Great Depression after 1933. Theodore Kubitschek, president of Bohemian Savings and Loan, is worried that higher interest rates these days are not helping. Now, higher interest rates are supposed to hold down inflation, right? Generally speaking. Well, this is the theory that Arthur Burns is uh, using, um, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, he has only one weapon, and that is to raise the cost of money to the commercial banks. And uh, he's doing this. Um, but it isn't so far seemingly doing too much good because um, businesses who borrow from banks feel that the rate is still cheaper than the inflation rate. When I was appointed by Jimmy Carter, he was kind of up against it. It was a very difficult period. I told him we were going to have to adopt tighter policies. So